A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to welcome you all to the 158th BASL webinar and the fourth episode of the fifth webinar series of Beyond Code Practice. The webinars are conducted on the Zoom platform and for those who have been unable to register on Zoom could also join by watching the live stream of the BASL YouTube channel. These webinar series are organized by the Seminars Committee of the BASL, Chairman of the Seminars Committee and Secretary to BASL, Mr. Rajiv Amrasuria, whose brainchild the BASL webinar series is. Convener of the Seminars Committee, Assistant Secretary, BASL, Mr. Pasindo Silva, and the co-conveners, Mr. Pandula Vanyarachi, Mr. Oshanu Beratna, Ms. Anne Devananda, and Ms. Nikini Mapiti Gama. I further take this opportunity to thank the president of the BASL, Mr. Salia Pires, President's Council, and the other members of the management committee of the BASL for all the support and the guidance given to us. Today's episode is with Ms. Kimali Fernando, attorney at law, chairperson of Sri Lanka Tourism, and interviewed and introduced by Mr. Chanakya Jayadeva, attorney at law. Without any further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Jayadeva to take over, sir. Thank you, Pasindu, and, and good evening and welcome to Beyond Court Practice, the fifth episode, like you said, and the 158th uh, of this webinar series of the Bar Session webinar series, which we've been doing for the last uh, two years. So. so as you heard, my guest is Kimali Fernando, current chairperson of the Sri Lanka Tourism. Kimali, uh, has uh, nearly uh, 32 years of experience in a proven track record in corporate, corporate governance. Large part of her life was spent on banking industry and other finance industry uh, work as well. Uh, she also is involved in policy framework uh, in tourism, tea, pepper, cinnamon and dairy and fisheries and other products. Kemal's education goes back to having an LLB honors from London School of Economics and Political Science from London, uh, London, and also she's a barrister at law from Lincoln Inn, attorney from Sri Lanka, and the list goes on. So, without running through too much of a CV, uh, let me invite you, Kimali. Good evening, and how are you today? Good. Thank you so much, and are you born? And welcome to all of you. Well, well, well said. I should have said Aibu is after all Sri Lanka tourism. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tell me, uh, we as as we got a lot to go through about your experience. You know, as you know, we we do this uh, series to share uh, the experience of people like you uh, for the up and coming lawyers and law students who would want to uh, see if what are the avenues that will be available for them beyond court practice than doing the usual thing. But first of all, Kimal, tell me, how did law happen to you? How did you get into doing law? Yes, Chanaka. Basically, I did my A-levels, I did my O-levels in Sri Lanka, uh -huh. but then did my A-levels in London. And there, thankfully, I had the opportunity to select law as an A-level subject. So I studied a law, a law as well as economics and accounting. And that kind of gave me the exposure to law initially. Then also my uncle, Vivanka uh, Vikramasinghe, uh, was a famous lawyer. He passed away, I, unfortunately, in courts when I was there. So I was inspired also by him. And that also was the reason that after studying A-level law, that I said, okay, I want to study law and we got into London School of Economics and did my little be there. That that's how that's how all, all started, and that's how I started the LLB. Uh, and yeah. then, of course, after the LLB, he went to Lincoln's Inn, my uncle. Uh -huh. So then I decided, okay, I want to go to the same place. So I did my LLB there and came back to Sri Lanka. Uh -huh. And uh, then I thought, okay, I wanted to write a book. Uh, on company law because my mother had originally written a book on company law and it wasn't updated for many many years and soon after my barristers I started writing a company law book with that times uh, act at that time and then I was pleased that it was kind of a reference book uh, for a lot of law students even accountants I believe uh, so I started writing the book uh, and thereafter, I said, okay, I have to be a, become an attorney at law. So I contacted the, the law college and then I was told I had to do one year of exams, uh, for which I did. I actually went for maybe two or three lectures and then realized everything is all printed and notes. So I didn't attend lectures that much. But I then sat for that as well. 
uh, thereafter, what happened was there was by chance, there was a job available at Deutsche Bank. And my father said, you know, you're a permanent student. Mm -hmm. Now you better start working somewhere. So I said, no, 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 no. I want to go to the US and do my LLB. And I had got into LSE again and I had got into University of Pennsylvania in the US. And I was shocked this is like Columbia University. And they, I said, no, 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 I'm going to go now again and study. He said, no, no, no. I think you should work for a year or two and then go and study again. Uh, so that was my journey actually in banking. It was quite a coincidence initially. Uh, but I have to say that after I, I didn't practice law at all, after my, I mean, I just did the pupillage and the apprenticeship, that's it. I wasn't really motivated to be in courts. And I felt that I could, with my skills as a lawyer and with my LLB, that it gave me a very structured way of thinking. And I realized very early on in my career that law is encompasses every part of our life, every day, every minute. I mean, whether it's a corporate sector, whether it's PR, whether it is banking, whether it is tourism, uh, every area requires legal skills and not necessarily being a lawyer in a company or a bank that I did not want to do uh, because I felt that that almost restricts me. So what I did was when I applied, I didn't apply as a lawyer uh, to get a law, uh, like a job as a legal officer. I did not want that because I felt that a lot of the time companies then seek another counsel's opinion or they go to the attorney general if it's the government or to a private counsel. So I felt that would restrict me somewhat. So I, I applied as a graduate trainee and I just used my LLB only as a kind of a entry point, if you like, as a base to enter. And as soon as I entered the Deutsche Bank, uh, I was the first graduate trainee taken by Deutsche Bank in Sri Lanka. They just launched it. I was just partly lucky, really. And uh, there I was uh, exposed to the whole bank. So I learned about banking right from being a cashier to opening an LC to, you know, for treasury work and whatever, and then ended up in corporate banking. And there they sent me to, from there, they sent me actually to Singapore. Yeah. And in Singapore, I worked there for a while and I was given the exposure there. And so that led me on to going to Germany after that. And I went to Frankfurt actually, and I was in aircraft financing, the first Asian to be taken to aircraft financing in in Frankfurt and there I used you know legal the ability to study law and pass the law exams give you the ability to read one very well uh, and also structured thinking and that helped me with my um, sort of uh, experience in Deutsche in Frankfurt because lots of documents when you do aircraft financing and the accounting that the basics I learned I actually built on my knowledge on accounting and economics was really useful. I think law, economics, and accounting is a lovely combination uh, to have, and it kind of rounds you off. Uh, so yeah, so that's how I ended up in Deutsch. And from Deutsche Bank, I went to Standard Chartered, and there I was heading the corporate bank in there. There again, I helped them to write a book. I like, uh, I like studying, so that's what are my pastimes. I read a lot. Uh, so that kind of helped me, I think. And then after that, I went to Pan-Asia Bank as the CEO, was director there as well, and then went to NDB as a director and LB Finance as acting chairperson and was involved in all the risk committees and audit committees and all that. And then subsequently, I went on to Richard Pires, um, LB, LB Finance, Valuable, Delvage, et cetera, so many boards. And then uh, I joined government after 33 years of uh, private sector. Uh, it's a new uh, experience for me, government, uh, and I'm glad I took the job. And I think that at this age, at age 58, I know that I'm able to contribute uh, to society, to government. Uh, so I'm pleased that it's a completely different role. And there again, I'm using my law in a different way. All the gazettes, the Tourism Act, all that, but not necessarily as a lawyer. And I think it's far more fun to be a lawyer with the lawyer skills in corporate world. I think you can add far more value. Perhaps maybe I'm biased. I'm sure I'm a little bit biased, but more than just always going to courts or doing sort of deed work or doing kind of legal officer work. It's so much more exciting. And I think as lawyers, we can give so much more 
and it can be far more enriching to have a career beyond law, as your title says. Uh, and I am a testament to that. And I'm really pleased with the decisions really I've made. Yeah, I think you are a, uh, you are the textbook case we were looking for <laughs> to uh, inspire people because uh, you, you said uh, in in your short short introduction about about how you came into being that you wanted to pick uh, when you had the opportunity. You didn't look for the legal office job, which anybody, any normal person would first look and they probably end up if, if this is an option and that is not an option because, you know, legal office jobs are very few inside a bank, you know, it's, it's very uh, few and, and the other, other opportunities are more. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's nice to hear, hear how we came up. But what I want to know is now banking, as you know, is a specialized subject, right? It's a specialized subject. Once you went in, uh, you said you learned from ABCs. You learn you have to, like a rookie, you learn everything. Uh, did you have to learn, uh, no, were you able to basically do with your experiences as a management trainee to come up because the youngsters who are listening to us might want to know that, or do you have to have studied, um, uh, other banking, uh, you know, you know, the banking exams or accountancy exams or SIMA or chartered or whatever, was that a necessary or without that, with your LLB background and training on a hands-on job, if I may say? Uh, were, were you able to come up? What, what hands what? on on the job? I didn't do. I mean, I did. Uh, I I didn't do banking exams. Everyone said you need to, yeah. and I realized no, you don't. You see, when you, you, join, say you can, no, I need to get this clear. You mean to say it is not a mandatory thing to have banking exams, but no. with the other law qualifications, all of our young lawyers who are looking at us, they can go ahead and then have the commitment like you had to learn from the smallest bottom end, right? Yes, bottom up. absolutely. I went in there. I learned everything. Yeah. I was one person I remember to date, like, like it was yesterday. This was 33 years ago. I read the trade manual, which is like several inches thick in Deutsche. And people laughed and said, And I, I thought to myself, because one day I'm going to get to the top. And I realized that no point to do banking exams. You learn the system in the bank. The systems in Deutsch was amazing, right? So I read everything. And also what I did was I volunteered very early on in life. I, whenever someone was not there, I would say, sir, 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 mama, eka karanda, man karanda. someone is on leave. I used to volunteer and do. And I was never scared to take on other people's jobs if they were not around and someone needed help. So that way, what happened was I learned cash management. I learned everything, cashier's job, everything right from the beginning. And that's why when you become a CEO of a bank, you know the pain of those people. You know their job. So they can't sort of tell you something because you understand their job. You've done it, right? So you don't have to keep on studying. And I think this idea of overqualification, where people don't learn on the job and they spend most of their office career also trying to do the studies, Hmm. eventually what does an employer want hmm. employer wants in a bank for example they want to give the maximum return to their shareholders so you right. need to understand their goal in life huh? their goal in life is not to have you he'll have a qualification for you yeah. their goal in life is for the shareholders to get maximum return that's what you need to understand first yeah. then they put managers and staff and graduate trainees and whatever to achieve their yeah. goal then in a team, what do they want from you? They want from you reliable, honest team player who is going to make their life easier. Yeah. Not that you've had another qualification is not going to benefit them. Yeah. They don't care about your qualifications. As long as you add value to their team and your team achieve the goals and the target set, that's all they care about. Right? And they don't look now, government departments, unfortunately, they look for the next promotion to have another qualification. But private sector, no way. They don't look. I mean, there are people with all levels who become chairman of John Kills, for example. Right? You know that. There was, you know, my father was a chairman of Ekin Spence. He had only all levels. So they don't look for degrees. They look for how can you contribute to achieve the goal they want to achieve. So I think overqualification is unnecessarily but what you can really do and i could really genuinely advise you be a multitask person where you're not you know you don't say make a mage job make a mother karanda that kind of approach you should say mm -hmm. and learn 
and put in the hours. I mean, I work very long hours. I mean, I work 12, 13 hours, right? So I put in the hours, I learned everything, absorbed. And then what happens is, particularly when you're young, I mean, you're not married at that point, you don't have big burdens or whatever commitments, you are willing to come in early and leave last, yeah. right? And you learn the game. And then in the end, they will search for you and say, where is she, where is she, or where is he? Because this one is not there, but that she can do it or he can do it. And then you start getting promotions. Yeah. You start getting promotions. When you start getting promotion, success leads to success. One thing I have to tell you. Yeah. You start on a journey, volunteer, and then simultaneously what I did do was, as soon as I started my career, technology came into being. When I was in university, there was no technology. Yeah. Right? But when I started working, I realized, oh my God, I don't know anything about technology. So I paid for my own course part-time, Saturday, Sunday. I used to go and learn Excel and simple things. And I learned technology on the side because I realized I'm going to get stuck, right? So when you realize something you're missing, go get it, right? Don't expect the employer to sit and teach you and then say, you know, I know how to do Excel because in banking, you need Excel. You need computers, right? So that's, that's, that's how I would uh, put it actually. Right. Uh, I think you, you, you said a uh, very important thing about, uh, which I think which was recorded by, I think, Elon Musk, or, or, or I think it was Elon Musk who said this, that you don't hire people uh, and then uh, in a, in a, be in a situation that you have to tell them what to do. You hire people so that they can tell you what to do to develop the company. Right. So, uh, so that is for that, what you are telling is uh, for the youngsters, uh, basically uh, learn the hard way. Uh, bottom up and if you miss something if you feel you miss something go and that quali get that qualification but not necessarily subject specific qualifications thinking that that will add to you know that's what you're saying so Absolutely. you didn't do any banking exams so you never did any banking exams as you never went. and no. i ended up a ceo <laughs> you ended up a ceo oh that's that's amazing that's a that's a very good point now uh you started with foreign banks the foreign bank, right? Deutsche Bank, then to uh, then to uh, chartered. Then I went chartered, to Pan Asia. Yeah. Then you went to Pan Asia. Uh, working culture for 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 for, for young lawyer. Two two questions actually rolled into one. Uh, young lawyers who are thinking of getting into banking, we'll say qualified abroad. Like there are a lot of people uh, international qualifications also, which international banks might want. London or US or Australia or whatever. Uh, is the opportunity, uh, this is not as a legal officer, the lawyers, but like you, went to other uh, banking industry per se, opportunities wise or the culture wise, are, they, are there more opportunities rather in, in the local banks? Are they more prone to take you or the foreign banks are, have more a wider open door? Both have opportunities, honestly. Mm -hmm. Both have opportunities to take local banks are more on sometimes qualifications and things like that but foreign banks if you enter as a graduate trainee not only banks by the way if you join Unilever or any of the multinationals yeah. there are graduate trainee programs yeah. right whether you go to MAS or Brandix or any of these John Keels or Haley's or wherever you want to go yeah. apply not as a lawyer apply as a graduate yeah. or with a professional qualification when they say that apply and even if they don't put attorney at law and you haven't got LLB, say, you don't have LLB, but you have the attorney's exam, say, for example, apply for that and show your sports, show your debating skills, show your other, other leadership skills. You were a prefect, you played sports, you were all this. They are looking for people. Yeah. They're just putting a qualification because they need to have a minimum kind of a requirement. It is only entry requirement. And after that, no one cares what your degree is. Nobody cares whether you've got a first class or second class or third class. Nobody cares in private sector afterwards. Honest to God, nobody cares, right? They want you to deliver what they want to achieve. I mean, I'm telling you, go to the garment industry, go to the tea industry, go to technology, go to a BPO. Mm -hmm. They are wide open for you. And Sri Lanka has a dearth in the private sector of people with good attitudes. Mm -hmm. Our biggest issue with the youth, we are finding, is the sense of entitlement. Right? They think, okay, mata make a tiyanawa, so mata make a hambendone, make a, you know, I don't want to even lift a book or a chair or a whatever because this is, I am now a management trainee or a mahatya or a manager or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, private sector is looking for people who can be willing to do anything. 
if the this thing doesn't have get into the car put the petrol here right if it is something you know we are looking for team players who are focused on our goal for our organization not your personal goal unfortunately i see something in the government sector which is for me i think it's not a good thing i humbly say this after two years of being in government they are uh, sors and their scheme of recruitment is very focused on qualifications so many staff i find are even during office hours doing qualifications because they can't get a promotion if they don't have a qualification which adds no value to bring in tourists to me it adds no value to me so we, i we to, yeah we we come to that but you said a very important point about uh, which i discussed with varuni also and other speakers before about entitlement and attitude um uh, and uh, what do you really mean by now for young people uh, now people are listening to you this to this broadcast uh, who will be inspired by you are the people who are like in the first five years uh, kemali of uh, uh, of their after being qualified as lawyers or sometimes it could be even law students who are looking at. so we are looking at people who are below 30 right young and they have the rashness of youth and they may be experimenting thing you can't blame them that's their their niche and uh, these people might be different to that of our generation or your generation same generation because uh, they are millennials or almost millennials but when you say attitude what do you really expect from them what does the private sector expect of uh, attitude of a lawyer who wants to be in, uh, integrated in their business attitude is basically can do don't think that you are entitled to this and that and because i am a manager or a gadgeter i can't do a clerk's job right so people who are willing to do anything i mean i'll give you a small example the other day there was a, a, a crocodile in the, on the beach in gol in the gol face right yeah yeah we heard we heard Trina that Kansia, they wrote to me hundreds of whatsapp i'm not kidding you hundreds of whatsapp sabhapati mokadda me kimula gena karanne sabhapati meka karanne ai sabhapati meka karanne sab so they felt that government should catch all kibulas mm-hmm. in the sea and they genuinely felt entitled and quite annoyed that i was not going to take action to correct. so it's a kind of a way our people believe that government should provide every single thing so what i'm trying to say is that that sense of entitlement seems to come not only for students or youth but sri lankans tend to have that sense of entitlement where they feel government should provide that or their employer should provide that nobody has to, is is to do that when i say when you join organization join their sports join their committee volunteer volunteer be, do a job below you do a job above you if you want to be promoted you have to be if you do only your job you're never going to be promoted mm. if you are a clerk and you want to be a senior clerk behave like a senior clerk yeah. already then only you get that job how do you behave like a senior clerk the attitude the what you do how reliable are you how trustworthy are you how how do you contribute to that organization and if you want to be a manager behave like a manager long before right so that is what i mean and also see the pain of the employer step into their shoes for a while step into their shoes and see what are their pain points and how are you going to contribute to help them and don't wait always for instructions right and come up with ideas and say sir i saw this or madam i saw this what about this idea what about that because managers don't always have the right the right answers they are as lost sometimes as you yeah. right so they are looking for ideas and i think that if you read a lot i really believe in that if you read you say then must read a book about him read a book about uh, facebook read a book about i read avidly honestly and i find i learn a lot from reading and you get loads of everything's done been done before somewhere in the world you know it's nothing new so you can learn and reading you can actually fast track your career because you can be ahead of the curve so it doesn't mean that you have to do an exam i i'm anti doing lots of exams because i think um, you know exam you cram and do this exam there was somebody who applied the other day some 16 degrees or something i mean i really don't It's, take more than 16 degrees i really don't yeah. because that person will never be able to deliver what i want yes you know so at also one thing about private sector is very hands on result oriented no it's not like you are a professor in university yeah you have to deliver yeah. so that theory doesn't often help and 
I find when you're too qualified, you're unable to think outside the box because all you've learned is being an engineer or something else or whatever, then you're looking like this. That's why sometimes people who have only O levels have done very well. Yeah. <laughs> they are not put in a box. They are mm. not on track. You know, they are able to think open and look at a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the uh, things uh, uh, when you, you said about two things about the attitude, uh, can, can you hear me clearly? Am I yes. dropping? My voice is dropping. No. Now? Oh, okay. Okay. So because there's some complaints. Um, attitude, and you also mentioned the other word entitlement, you reiterated on that. Don't be entitlement focused, but have a good attitude. So which you basically may not focus attitude, focus on your job and have positive attitude uh, uh, towards what you're doing. But the immediate question that might come to youngsters in their mind, especially at the young age, and as you can see these unions and all that all over the world, especially in this part of the world, is when you are not focused on your entitlement, especially the private sector, might exploit you, right? Might exploit. You're not focused. That means you're doing everything. If you don't get the promotion or whatever in time or salary increment or whatever, uh, because you don't have an entitlement attitude, so you won't ask. So they might uh, use that to exploit you. Will this be the case or is it not? No, it's not. Is it because positive what happened, over you? Never you me, because what, yeah, what happened to me was hmm. because when I started delivering and becoming like useful to a team, you by chance will get a mentor in that organization. Hmm. Not an official mentor. Somebody will watch you, a man or a woman or a few people will watch you and say, wow, this person is going way beyond her job. Hmm. They look out for you. They watch out for you. Then what happens is in some organizations, of course, there are officially mentor being appointed to you. Okay. So that person is appointed to, to you know, go through your career with you and they will advise you. My case, at my time, there was no official mentors. Yeah. But what happened to me was I, by chance, got people who saw me and said, okay, she's delivering. So they guided me, said, why don't you apply for this job? Why don't you apply for that job? They gave me the increments. They gave me. So I never had to go and say, give me an increment. I demand it. No, I never had to do that. And in the private sector, when you deliver and profits are coming in your unit, you get big bonuses. Actually, you get sometimes millions of rupee bonuses, right? Millions of rupee bonuses, particularly even in even private sector, these public quoted banks give millions of this. CEOs get three, four million bonuses and more, right? So what happens is when you start delivering uh, people, because imagine Put yourself in the shoes of a CEO or a manager. What does he want? He wants the results. If you deliver, he rewards you. So you know, there, there is no sense of actually when you keep demanding a lot, what happens is maybe you're not doing good. And then no one like you, because you have not performed the way they are looking at. And one thing good about the private sector, I must say, often we are given half every six months uh, appraisal. Mm. That is the time that you should listen carefully for the genuine feedback which is told to you and say, Madam or Sir, this thing, can you tell me things I could improve? How can I improve? Is there something I need to do? Then listen to them and say, hey, you seem to be coming late to work every day or you know, you were not reliable, you gave inaccurate information or you were rude to a client or you were something, if they tell you, listen to that and correct it. Because they are telling you for your own good. Because if you do correct those things, you'll be super. You'll be super. And I also would give a small uh, idea, if possible, not always possible for everybody I know. Try, if you can, get foreign exposure by going overseas, even for a short time, for even a month, and work somewhere, even if it's a volunteer basis. And one thing I can tell you, I have always told my kids also about this, is that if you, success leads to success. So when you're young and you can't get a job, you tried and tried and tried, can't get a job, assuming. Huh? Then say, write to all the hotel, uh, companies in Sri Lanka. Talk to any contact you have. You have an uncle, an aunt, a friend, a friend's friend, friend's friend, friend's friend, network. And say, I don't mind working for three months free of charge to just get experience. Get a good CV, get a good company's name on your CV. Whether it is a Deutsche or a City or a Unilever or a MS or a Haley's or a whatever, get that on your CV. Because when the next person who sees your CV and says, oh, this person has spent three months in XY company, 
that gives them encouragement that okay they thought you were good enough but actually what you have done is it's voluntary work you would never got paid probably doesn't matter get it on your cv because the first job is the hardest for you i'm telling you the first job part of your job is the hardest cvs all look quite generic let's be honest a cv is you know everyone's got a beautiful cv they look pretty generic to you how do you differentiate yourself is study that a lot of people send me cvs but it to me looks soulless mm-hmm. soulless cvs but if they have written three sentences at the beginning about say for example now i'm in tourism if they wrote three sentences at the beginning i am nimal pereira or whatever tourism is important thing da 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 uh, this is how they this thing three sentences and then told me what your education whatever said so and and the interview had already gone through my website already known the arrivals have understood tourism and read about tourism in thailand or something he brings to me something i would think hmm this guy is interesting i like this guy he's done a deep study about my company he knows my industry a little bit he seems the guy who go out of his way more sent a stand at cv knows nothing about tourism nothing and they think you should give me a job and i'm thinking i don't need to give you a job i don't need to give you a job i don't need to give anybody a job right so that's something else for the first time when you apply if you cannot and you desperately try then you know sri lanka is a small place you know someone who knows someone who knows someone how did it now i have youngsters who come to me and says i will work free mm. give me exposure i will take them i don't want a salary i want to work with you i've seen what you do i like to work with you i want to learn from you i have given job like that yeah. no salary they come and work with me for 3 months right they get a letter from me saying so and so work excellent perform da 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 is can i put you on as a referee i said sure you deliver i'm happy to put you away so that's how you start your journey not always with a formal job sometimes in the most unconventional way and also another thing we look at and i do look at where you volunteered it doesn't matter where you volunteered to look after animals or help the poor or did a charity job work Uh, help people who were uh, as a lawyer you could say that you stood up for people who um, you know who were battered women mm. now in the law college also i was in the uh, human rights one uh, committee mm. right and we went to the prisons voluntary did i get paid no but that was on my cv right so we went to prisons and help people to get who were in remand right even in lsc i was in various committees did i get paid no it was experience i got plus my cv looked impressive because oh she was in that committee she was in this committee she had done and i gave examples what i learned from it not just say i i was da 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 the cv she said and i helped somebody get out of prison who was in remand for 6 years we helped them to get so that's like a live case you say in the cv two one sentence two sentences without just say people just say mara committee make committee make committee even me mukakkari denuma ke ke kene make it personalized what what did you learn what was it that you contributed oh i was in the debate in society people say yeah so there you can say i was in the debate in society where i was able to win a, this thing on the question of human rights where this was da 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 da, da. so that gives you make you unique the cv should be something that makes you as a person unique and stands out and then when you come to the interview lot of ladies i find they apply for a job and i i will them sometimes because they apply for the job they are too qualified for the job mm. they only apply when they have met all those requirements no apply for a job that you haven't met all the requirements but you can get those requirements you know i think you don't need to be perfect right so you and men are better young boys are better they can one of the magi allowance can one of the pet the petrol then another phone ka then or then on you know private sector you can ask that but sometimes it's good to get that first job you know just yeah. get that job don't focus on that so much because after you get in you can sort it out you can sort things out after you get in so that would be my advice to youngsters actually yeah uh, you said something like you know the ivy league university entry says that what i need to see in your cv especially harvard is something that dazzles the uh interviewer right that's what you are looking for 
as yeah. Malapur and you're look, looking for that. So uh, that's very interesting, Kemal. You, you touched upon an area about how basically how to redraft the CV. If I if I may use that term, because our CVs are very very uh, very mundane and cliche. Yes. Um, now these all things as your expertise come from 30 years or something in the private sector, right? So your mindset is like that. And like you correctly said, you are in only two years in the state sector. Now, somebody who's watching this want to know how the opportunities would work in a state sector. We will say, I'm not saying you can speak for the whole state sector. Uh, take your industry where you're heading. Now you're one person in, in the institution and there are boards and all those sort of things. Uh, getting into state sector also, especially under your, your purview or other sectors, are they, are the, I mean, I won't ask a question, opportunities, opportunities comes and go. Uh, can we, somebody with a law background come and work in a non-law capacity? Is that, is that allowed? At least in the tourism ministry and uh, your, your divisions, is it allowed? Yes, absolutely. You, you would take somebody I from- would, yeah, absolutely, I would take, yeah, absolutely, I would take, yeah. The, uh, the government sector is very, unfortunately, very structured. Mm -hmm. And they have made these SORs that often to me makes no sense. And I'm in the process of changing them. Right. So they would have like all sorts of historic reasons. They would put all sorts of degrees. May degree I said, a degree only a degree. A degree only tells me he has skills or she has skills to study, understand something and have passed. That's all that tells me. Mm -hmm. So I am in the process of changing SOAs in our, our unit anyway, okay. where we say a, dig, a degree. It doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or whether you're an accountant or whether you are a lawyer. I just want basic skills that only tells me you are intelligent. You can sit for some exams. That's about it. After that, I look at your skills your skills so i am in the process of changing this in our uh, unit it's not an easy thing i have to tell you uh, it's not easy but now for example there are engineers using in promotion bureau yeah. very good you'd ask me how did the engineer can he do promotion yeah. yes he can yeah. brilliantly in fact i have one engineer right then i have several engineers in investments yeah. now you tell me how did you take someone who's an engineer to do investments in tourism Brilliant job. The director now uh, of uh, the, the investments is an engineer and have just promoted him to deputy di director general. <sighs> just promoted because him. Because he delivered what you want. Absolutely. Superstar. Yeah. Now he's an engineer. Engineers and lawyers have something in common. Structured thinking. Wow. Both groups of people are able to think in a structured manner. Yeah. What is the problem? Break down the problem. Because in courts, you have to do that thing. Yeah, in yeah. courts, you are very well trained. Yeah. The problem maker. Then you have the evidence. What is our harass maker? You are learning that. Yeah. Like you can do a mind map. No, I do a lot of mind maps. I use a lot of mind maps for problems and tasks, right? Yeah. So you know you have then witnesses and your the lawyers do that in a different way. But I use mind maps every day. I mean, I have books and books, exercise books, even right in front of me now. Problem. Who are the stakeholders to find the solution? Then I put more lines and where, do, where are the solutions? Then what is the plan? And I do it that way. So absolutely, I would take a lawyer. The moment I change this, so I absolutely would take a lawyer because lawyers can write. You know, when we are doing promotion also, you'd be able to read and write lots of documents in promotion because we're dealing with foreigners. If you're talking to BBC, they'll give you a huge document. Mm. Like if you cannot read, and understand what they're going to do in BBC, right? Yeah. It's of no use. Language skills, of course, is really important. Yeah. And this is something, unfortunately, I think, maybe the education, so whatever, we are failing somewhat in language skills. We have no choice. We need to understand and read, write English really well, really well, okay? To do well in, 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 in the private sector as well as in my institution tourism in my case i would say even you have to have a foreign language like i know a little german i studied german because i was in, i had to go to germany and work in germany but additional language skills in tourism is really useful right so i would recommend that more than doing some other exam and you know getting collective all the exams get real skills that you need Project management skills, there's another one. Technology, I would really recommend. And when I say technology, project management, language skills, I don't expect you to do exams, but have the skill. All I'm asking is have the skill, right? 
that's all you need. Yeah. So you you mentioned about structured thinking, lawyers and engineers Sam. Now, what I need a clarification is: is that good, or you need to unlearn and come out of structured thinking and come out of the box in order to work as a business person? What do you need? You know something? You can't give an answer to it, yes or no, for both, because there are some situations your normal knowledge will be really useful structured thinking. But there are some days, leave that aside. Start with a blank sheet of paper. Have these magic boards. I have many, right? You just leave your history, leave your knowledge. Start from scratch. And very important, cross-functional teams. I really believe in that. I do that all the time, every day. So I would get, I have, I'm the chairperson of four institutions, right? There were four chairmen those days. Now I'm thankfully the chairman of all four. So I get team people from all four into one room. And they said, But they're all doing tourism, beauty. But they never met. Because they, each chairman had his own manner and his own whatever. He created it and he kept his people separately. Yeah. Right. So now I put them all together. So I'll have someone from promotion bureau, someone from convention bureau, someone from my hotel school, someone from SL, SLTDA, which is regulatory. Yeah. I put them in one room and we have multiple people with different skills and knowledge. And then they bring out different angles to a problem. Yeah. And we find solutions. And lot, what I do a lot is working with other departments like immigration, the police, the army, then airport aviation, civil aviation, we work CCF, wildlife, and working in the private sector, cross-functional teams comes to me naturally. Because private sector, now if you are in a garment industry, say, production manager doesn't, production manager doesn't sit here on his own. He will meet the marketing guy. He will meet the finance guy. He meets the CEO. He meets the owner. He meets the trade unions. He meets the employees. So we, we work with cross-functional teams. That comes naturally to us. Right. But what happens with government, like tourism, I can say they just work one place, but cross functional team. Now, if you are a lost lawyer now today, a youngster, and you're given a task of some task in a private sector or government, immediately reach out to other people and say, well, ask the Matika Varakarana committee at Dara, make a poda, copy take a kutura, karanapula. A lot of people will agree with you. Right. Get them involved in your task. And brainstorm with them because they will give you different ideas, particularly for me coming as a newcomer to government. I had to do that. I had no choice. Because I didn't know the government guidelines. I didn't. Right. So I needed. And when we wanted a director general to be recruited and I was asked at the highest level, what kind of person do you want? I said, sir, Matone man danne thi akya game. Mama danne andwe. Like Elon Musk, somebody who can tell you what to do. <laughs> I got a public servant, a director general, who's to really qualified. Yeah. And I had only one request. I said, I, I want someone who knows public service because I have zero knowledge, who will not get me into trouble because otherwise I will break, break all the rules and who doesn't have a lot of uh, burden, like who, who can put in 16 hours that I work. Yeah. So I got someone uh, who is actually she's single. She's not married. She has about 25, 30 years of experience, expert in government service. I yes. got all SLS degree, whatever. And I got someone who, see, when you create a team, don't get a replica of yourself. Exactly. Get, look at your weaknesses and put that, supplement that person, sort your weaknesses. And together with her and me, then we are a super team. Oh. I rely on her a lot and she relies on me a lot. So that's how it works. So your interpretation of a leader is also a team player. Can oh. I say that? A leader has to be a team player. Team how would player. You Humility, courageous in a crisis, you have to be courageous. Like with COVID, we have to be courageous. And a leader is someone who's, who should be able to work in an environment when things are not clear, yeah. when you don't know really the answer sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, we had to face the media, for example, repeatedly during COVID. Did we have the answers to everything? Yeah. No. But we had to work in an environment while we are learning, we are still delivering. We are able to be courageous to say that I don't know something and I will find it out and reach out to others. There are other specialists like in the COVID situation, classically, it was the COVID task force. I was appointed to the COVID task force by His Excellency, the president. The Army commander was heading it. And so there we had multi groups of people. We had health, we had immigration, we had army, we had police, we had uh, PHIs. So different groups of people I worked with. 
right? So in a crisis situation, you need to be able to work with others, learn from others. And always, if you have a moral compass, I think we each have our own moral compass, right? I'm a staunch Buddhist, I'm a vegetarian, and I, I have a strong moral compass in me, right? I believe that at my age, I need to give back to society. That's what I believe. And I took this job two years ago for the respect of his excellency president, right? And I'm taking this job on an honorary basis. I don't take a salary. I don't take an allowance. I don't take a car. Even if I travel not tomorrow morning, I'm traveling early morning. I pay for my own ticket. So I have come to a stage in life where I want to give something back to society and I don't want any benefits from it. I have reached that. I mean, I earn money. I earned a lot of money throughout my career. So I don't expect youngsters to do what I'm doing today. Right. But yeah. this is where I have reached Right. So as a as a leader, I think you should be a team player. You should be courageous when you have to be. You need to be strength. You have to have strength also. Huh? You should not get bullied. And particularly as a woman, a CEO, a chairman, first time a woman chairman now, you they try to sort of bully you. And you have to be courageous and you have to be able to face what, whatever you have to face courageously. There are days it's a lonely road. There are days it's a lonely road because you are alone. Sometimes you're handling some things, but more than often you are working with teams and different personalities and ability to understand personalities is also very important. And ability to understand each person's strength and each person's weakness. And very important is to understand your weakness. Find out your weakness and try to get someone to supplement your weakness. That's very important. I mean, coming back to the recruitment thing about uh, getting jobs in government. Uh, one of the things uh, people here now, this would apply to both government and private sector in Sri Lanka, especially countries like this. Uh, these youngsters, one of the main complaints is that, okay, even though I may have the drive now, what you, what you expect is the attitude and the drive. Uh, irrespective of law, I'm going to be a management trainee. No problem, right? Humility, drive, everything is there. Still, it is useless because I need to know someone. It's my reference. If especially government sector, I need to be in the right side of the aisle, which is ruling, right? And uh, or connection some, to somebody in the right side of the aisle. If it's private sector, okay, um, you know, I, I need to have some connection. So what is the answer to this question uh, for the youngsters to you? And you told me uh, the beginning that your father was chairman of Aitken Spence. Did that play a role in your getting into Deutsche Bank or was it purely merit? I'll ask the last question first. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> Not at all because there was an American CEO at that time and he didn't know who Ekin Spence or my father was. So he didn't even ask who I was. I just went for the interview and he told me subsequently, he said, I was, in, I was so inspired by your energy and you're willing to learn. And he, he, that's how he gave me the job. And he eventually became one of my mentors for a short time by, by chance. No, because when in private sector, the connections doesn't matter because private sector shareholders want the return. And if you're going to contribute, they are going to take you. They are not correct, worried about politics. With regards to government sector, yes, there have been issues always in the past, but I can tell you the institutions I'm leading, I can only speak for that, is that I do not look who, whether you're which party or which opposition or with their government or whatever. I only look at your capability. And in fact, I have been criticized for that saying that, you know, I don't look, but I do not want to look because that is not the way I work. I work, if you will deliver, I recognize you. So I do have uh, complaints by even sometimes from our trade union saying, so I always say, party that's what happens. So, yes, I'm criticized for it, that I'm not looking at this kind of a thing, but I have stood my ground in the interest of the country to ensure that we deliver. And that's why we have been successful, despite all the challenges we've had all these years, uh, that we've been successful is we've stuck to key principles, professionalism, and always, always doing the right thing. And the deep, deep uh, love uh, for our country and the belief that at this age, at my age now at 58, that I should, I must uh, contribute to my country. I have kids now, 25 year old, 26 year olds, who are both overseas, working overseas. 
And I think that it is time that we contribute. And if we don't, we talk complaining, I used to always complain, government should do this, government should do that. Now I thought to myself, I'll join government, mm. right? And let's contribute. So I think as private sector people, we need to join government and contribute. Not everyone can do that, I suppose. But at some stage in your life, and I'm not saying it's not a bed of roses, I have to tell you, it's hard, very, very hard. And I have got an increased respect for government servants I never had before. Mm. Government servants have the toughest job mm. because the ones who work, there will be always allegations. Yeah. The ones who don't work, they get the same. And they are the ones who write the kalapattares and whatever. And the ones who work, they will have audit queries and all these things uh, because of that. So I have a deep respect uh, for, for public servants and the challenging job they have. It's not easy. So that's why a lot of them don't want to sign anything. They'd rather not sign anything. They, they just rather attend loads of meetings and not even sign a letter because they are fearful because governments change and then they have learned the hard way. Previous government also, they have all been taken to all these FCIDs and whatever. So everyone is very fearful uh, to sign. And this is really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. So that is something that all of the public should know. The job of a public servant is not easy. And when they criticize public servants, there are loads of guidelines. I tell you something, there are so many guidelines they have to go through. What I would do in private sector in a week takes me six months to do. Because so many signatures, so many committees, evaluation committee, procurement committee, all these things that if they don't follow that, there are audit inquiries and then it goes to co-op. And so they are fearful. So don't criticize government servants. It's not an easy job. Have you, in, in short, have you done anything or are you able to, like you said, you have changed so SOR, so SOP, so whatever. Are you able to um, do something to take away that fear of those people? And also, uh, are you able to change a lot of these uh, uh, you know, bureaucratic red tape, which is, this is worldwide. I mean, even in developed countries, it's the same. Uh, are you able to do anything? Yes, on that? I am. Short answer is I am, and I am doing it. And in fact, technology I'm using a lot. Now, for example, when I came, everything was done manually. Registration was done manually. A lot of malpractice. People have had it to, you know, accusations of malpractice, put it this way, where people had to pay bribes and what have you. Now we've automated the whole registration. Completely automated. So even you want to start a travel agency or you want to uh, register a hotel, you can do it online today. You don't have to come to my office at all. Oh. Technology is one thing I'm using. Second thing I'm using is changing unnecessary guidelines. There were crazy guidelines which made zero sense. Yes. Zero sense. I mean, they said like to be a travel agent, you have to have brochures, you have to have AC, you have to have some parking, you have to have all sorts of rubbish. I've removed all of them. That's how we have increased registration by 48%, even during COVID, 48%. Then we actually redid the whole investments. Investments were really hard to do. People had to go to 20, 30 line agencies to do investments in tourism. What did we do? We re-engineered the whole process. Now it's one application for all of government in tourism. If you come to me today, you can apply one shot and I will coordinate for you with the other line agencies. You don't have to go. So re-engineering processes, removing unnecessary guidelines is something I have already succeeded in doing. And there's a lot more still to be done. The SORs is a huge struggle because I can't do that on my own. And so therefore I need various other ministries, of course. This is the challenge for me. But I will continue to pursue that because that if we do that and leave this legacy behind, I think next person, next government, next chairpersons will benefit and will be grateful and the country will be beneficial, benefit greatly if we succeed in that. Yeah, You mentioned about you having two kids and now they're grown up. But one of the other question that comes to mind of the, especially the ladies <clears throat> who are watching this, the young ones who we are catering, how they can do a beyond the court practice uh, uh, company involvement. Uh, now, let's take an example from, from most of the people I know in my era. One of the things they wanted to do to become a practicing lawyer under a senior or to go to a company as a legal job uh, is that they will have eventually when they get married soon after, you know, for a couple of years after, uh, they will have more time for the kids, right? Whereas uh, the mindset is there in youngsters, even in lawyers uh, who are coming out, that if you go to private sector, like you said in the beginning, long hours, right? And then unless you are a career woman, because career woman is looked at in a bit of a negative way, you might not be able to successfully, equally successfully bring up your children and your family, right? What is your take on this? 
I don't agree that's with that at all. Yeah. yeah, I don't agree with that at all. Yeah. First of all, as a woman, decide what you want in life. Okay, forget what your husband says, your mother says, your father says. If you want to reach the top, right? There are certain things you have to do and you can do. I'm telling you, you can. Don't, please don't take the easy way out and say, oh, okay, I'll just do some convincing and let's get some money and this kind of idea. Oh my God, no, you're way better than that. You're way better than that, right? So what you have to do early on, as soon as you uh, qualify as a lawyer, you're not married immediately, maybe not hopefully. So you will have time at the beginning, the first two, three years, you may have some time. Right. So when you join a law firm or when you join a private sector, for example, put in the hours and get in and be plan yourself. What I did was I was very disciplined with my time. I was very organized. It sounds stupid, but even simple things like your, my food things. I had it in English and single in my computer. I had to print it. Tap, marker, no, marker, no, marker, no. I delegated unnecessary things, which I didn't add value yeah, to. Yeah. 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 The grocery list, I used to make it in English and single, uh, standard printout, and I had printed it. I had like 30 copies of it, and I don't have to even write that. I just mark, like, this is make, I want to make, 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 make. Then I got friendly with like the supermarket girl there, and I used to say, Mama make a basalana udeta, while astica, those is no delivery, no? Basalana, may man have a savila ganda. Rushed in, city city bags or a hari petibula daratiba, credit card again give up, do again a liatava. So simple things, otherwise, you spend hours food shopping. Yeah. Of course, I sacrificed a lot. I sacrificed, I didn't have the pedicure, the manicure, I didn't go for coffee, tea, tea parties, all the things some of my friends did, I could not do. So all I'm telling you is decide, do you want to be a CEO of a bank? Do you want to be a chairman of a company? Do you want to be a chairman of a government institution? If that's what you want to do and not have regrets in life, because later on you'll see your husband achieving something or your brother achieving something and you're just doing something else. And you, if you are not going to be happy with that, don't accept it. Say to yourself, this is where I want to be. I knew early on in life, I want to reach the top of the career of commercial bank, a commercial side. I knew that very early on in life, right? When I was 16, 17, I decided I'm going to be something, right? I'm going to be something. I decided that. And when you decide that, manage your time, delegate things that are irrelevant, not necessary for you to do. Whether you ask your mother or your father, or your brother, or your sister, or somebody else to do, right? When you have kids, right? Teach them early on in life to wash their plate, to make their bed, to do these things. They enjoy it when they're young, actually. And then they get trained, right? If you have to drop the kids to school, every day you don't have to drop them to school. Your neighbor can drop them one day. You can drop their kids one day. Delegate, delegate, delegate. Kids don't have to always be dropped by you, by the way. You don't think you're that this thing. If you have one good meal with them, whether it is a lunch or a dinner, you have with them and spend quality time rather than tired, happy, looking after them. Best is to make do your career, be happy. And then that one hour or two hours, give them quality time. Give them quality time. That's so much better as a career woman than spending hours and being unhappy as a housewife and saying, you know, look at that one, they have it all. You don't have to do that, right? So I so can promise you this, that you as a woman, we are courageous, we are smart. And I'm telling you as a woman, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. Whatever you put your mind to, you can achieve. But you need to manage your time, be disciplined about your time. Don't waste your time on unnecessary things. And one thing you must remember as a woman, you cannot be the best of everything. If you see me or any other woman who has achieved something, don't think that woman has everything. We don't. <laughs> One thing, we don't. We are not the best mother, the best wife, the best friend, the best neighbor, the best uh, uh, hairdo, best whatever, whatever, best child. No, we don't. We have sacrificed some things. We might have not been the best ch child sometimes. I may have not spent enough time with my parents sometimes. But they understand. I may have not always been the best friend when I've come for every birthday party and every social event. I may have missed some. And I have many at times missed some. Right. So, yes, but to go on that journey, we have to sacrifice and don't think 
she has it all. I don't have it all. No woman who's got to the top has had it all. The husband has sacrificed. The children have sacrificed. The friends have sacrificed. My parents have sacrificed. For sure, my parents have sacrificed. When I get to the top, that's the way it is. That is the way life is. It's, do, do you think it's fair? It's not. Don't think life is fair. Life wasn't meant to be fair. And it's not going to be fair. And as a woman, I'm telling you, it's not fair at all. There are times I have seen for me to get to where I was, I had to be 30, 40% better than a man. But I did it. <laughs> Don't think it's unfair. Don't harp on it's what's unfair. Harp on your journey, where you want to go, your destination, and how you're going to get there. Right? Are you mad, unfair, are you make a And also what we don't do enough is we don't network as a woman enough. Men have their own way of networking, much on level, their old school network. Now another college. Girls night out? Huh? huh? Girls night out? Not yes, a... yes, girls night out. But, you know, it's Not boys everybody. need to be very clickish, whatever. You don't have to do the machang that style, but you can do your own style. As a woman, have your own style. The way you dress has been to your own style. Yeah. And you, the way you do things. And But what I want to tell you is you have to network though with men and with women. Go for those events. Go for those committee meetings. Go for those gatherings. Don't avoid them because you make connections that way. And as a woman, I could humbly say to you, and I say it as an older woman, maybe as a 50 or 58, is that when you dress, don't dress as a woman being, you know, sexual way or anything like that. Dress all this professionally, not as a woman, but professionally. Because, you know, you come for an interview, put loads of perfume, uh, you know, dress quite open way and short skirts and whatever. It doesn't always give a good impression, depending on your job, though. But it doesn't give a good impression. So that femininity is something that, yes, you're a woman, but that is not the reason you should get the job. You should get the job because you come across as a very professional woman. As a banker, I used to always wear almost 90% of my time black yeah. uh, and a black suit, a trouser or a long skirt. With this, because I didn't want to make it pink and whatever at that time. Because I didn't want, I wanted to give them like a, almost a male persona almost because I felt I wanted to look professional. But now I'm comfortable at the age of 58. I mean, I can wear red or pink or green or whatever I want. It doesn't matter, but at the early part of your career, be smart about what you wear yeah. uh, because it has a particular impression about you and people make an impression about you and it sticks kind of ish. Yeah. So you don't want that kind of an impression made about you. So be careful about that. But I urge all the female lawyers more so than the males. You can succeed if you make up your mind, make a career path and say, you know, that's another thing. Be willing to work lateral flows. Okay. Yeah. So it's not always like this going up. Yeah. Some days you are in a bank and then you join private sector, then you join government, then you go up and then you may stagnate. Then you move laterally, learn a new skill, learn a new skill, move up. You know, so you can move laterally, you can move multiple industries and get to the destination. It's not like those days where you join, like my father joined at age 18, Akin Spence, ended up as a chairperson of Akin Spence 60, 70 years later. Yeah. It's not like that anymore. You keep moving jobs, yeah. right? But be careful, youngsters. You are come across sometimes to us who read your series as not a doer and not a consistent person. When I see someone having moved jobs every one year, it puts me off because I think this person is not a doer who's not committed. And maybe he had problems with his boss. Maybe he's not a team player. That's why he's moving. So you do need to have on your CV at least about three years stints here and there, minimum, because that shows you're committed. That shows the bosses liked you. That shows you got some kind of increment or you need some additional job. So don't keep moving too much. Because I see CVs that they've moved like every six months. And I'm thinking maybe nobody wanted this person. Exactly. Right? So be careful about that too. Some of the things you said about uh, advice to women, I think you should put together and uh, write a song. It'll be <laughs> what did Some you, say? you said about uh, one is not everything. We've heard about uh, well, reality. You should put together and make us uh, write a song. <laughs> I think it did. Anyway, Kimali uh, Fernando, chairperson of Sri Lanka Tourism, uh, attorney at law. Thank you very much for joining us, Kimali, and your 
enthralling, intriguing thoughts. I'm sure uh, our, our youngsters would really, um, uh, really uh, get benefited from that. And I think I'm uh, re-justified in calling you as a textbook case for our, uh, our, our guests. Uh, and thank you again uh, for, for joining us. And we wish you uh, success in, in, in your journey in the government sector and all the changes you're going to do do and we hope to meet you once again in probably a seminar like this we would like you to address more uh more events for our youngsters in the future of the bio session thank you on behalf of bio session thank so that's know. uh th thank you that's beyond practice uh, beyond code practice for today uh my guest was uh, kimali uh, fernando chairperson of sri lanka tourism the very intriguing interview today and i'll join you again um this saturday it's not going to be uh the same days like it used to be last week but this saturday at 5 30. thank you again for joining uh, us today and thank you to kemali fernando again uh, i'll see you uh, on saturday at 5 30 with another episode rather the episode six of beyond court practice good night and have a good day